Hyphenation from Slate. From Slate, this is Hi-Fi Nation. Philosophy in story form. Recording from Vassar College, here's Barry Lamb. Right now, it takes a lot to change your gender legally in the UK. You have to live for two years as the gender you want the law to recognize, and that has to be somehow certified. You have to get two diagnoses from doctors that you have gender dysphoria disorder. And if you're married, your spouse has to consent to the gender change. Then everything has to come to a government panel, the Gender Recognition Panel, and they get to make the final judgment. All of this might change, or it might not. Last year, the UK government opened up the law to debate, and it's considering whether self-identification is enough to get a gender change certificate. The debate has drafted philosophers into making arguments in public about what gender really is, who really is a woman or a man, or any other gender, and all of it is in service of supporting or resisting the movement for trans rights. What was once a limited issue relegated to the pages of academic journals has gone public, and publicly very ugly. In particular, it's pitted trans rights advocates against certain feminists, a division I was naive enough to think didn't exist. But it does, and it has for many years. The wing of feminist philosophy that has resisted recognition and acceptance of transgender identities has been around for a long time. On today's episode of Hi-Fi Nation, we look at the story of its origin in the 70s and the two women whose clash led to the ideas that are today's transgender movement and its feminist opposition. On the next episode, we see how these events of the 70s resonate today. I'm Sandy Stone. I'm a mom and a grandmother, and I live in Santa Cruz, California. I'm Professor Emerita of Communication from the University of Texas at Austin. I'm also transgender. I grew up in a middle-class Jewish family. My name was uh, Zelig ben Nathan, and everything went fine until it didn't. I was such a typical trans kid. I began to have dreams when I was about five years old that I was playing with girls, little girls my age. We were swimming rivers and climbing mountains and hiking in the wilderness and uh, hunting animals and living in trees. and, And there's a standard way in the 1950s, 40s, that people would have behaved if they felt that they were trans. The only role model I had was Christine Jorgensen, who was about as useless as you can think she would have been. Christine was tall and willowy and blonde and wore heels, and I was short and and dark and, you know, everything that Christine wasn't. And I went off on my own to San Francisco, and the minute I got there, I picked up the phone and began to look for resources. The closest thing to it was one of the first organizations for gay men at the time, which was called the Mattachine Society. I called them, and I explained, without using those exact words, that I was transgender, because transgender as a term had not yet been invented. And I asked them, do you have anyone who can help me? And Mattachine said, uh, well, um, no. Why don't you call the Daughters of Boletus, which was another lesbian organization? So I did. And the wonderful daughter said, uh, well, uh, no, we don't have anything for you, but why don't you try calling the police? It turns out that the police department in San Francisco was actually running a trans outreach program called the Transsexual Counseling Unit, the TCU. I was able to winkle out their phone number, 
called them up, went down there, and was face to face for the first time in my life with a real trans person who looked at me and said in an acid tone, so you think you're a woman. Uh, yeah, I do. And uh, she said, let me see what I can do for you. And she proceeded to take me on a Dante-esque tour of hell. Into the basements of safe houses for trans people, all the ones she was showing me had not made it through transition, but who had gotten stuck in the middle. This is all in the uh, 1960s that this is happening, so try to put it in perspective. Uh, these were people who had not succeeded in making it through transition, so they had fallen out of society completely. Wow, wow Sandy, could you tell me what that means? Does it mean they... There were attempts at surgery, attempts at uh, alteration. What, what does it mean? They didn't make it out. What well, was happening back then? The, yeah. At that time, the options were very limited, and the understanding of the immense, infinite possibilities of trans were not yet present. Remember, we were in the tender line. It was the police department. The other people in, that they were working with were trans people who were hooking who were doing sex work because they were unemployable as anything else. And the people who couldn't get work as sex workers were totally unemployed. And many of them were people who had started out without much in the way of financial resources and had run out partway through their efforts at transition. And they were now unpresentable as male and they were also unpresentable as female. At that point, surgery was done in two stages. First stage was castration, if you were male to female. Female to males were barely visible, although they were there. So everyone that I was being shown was male to female. So there were people who had essentially had their testicles removed, but still were intact as male with penises and nothing else. So they were not producing very much male hormones, but they were producing enough so that they still grew kind of halfway beards. And they had attempted electrolysis with people who were not very good. And so their faces tended to look like the surface of the moon. The purpose of my being shown them was to say, this is who you are. And that is a very interesting thing to have happen. When someone shows you the people whom they think are the very bottom of society, they're as low as you can go. The fact that I was shown these people in a basement is reinforcing the metaphor of, of going down into the underworld. There were actually red light bulbs in the, in the ceiling fixtures. The whole diegetic of this is you're in hell, and this is what's going to happen to you. This is who you're going to be. How, how did you react? What was your emotional response to this? Well, it wasn't what she thought it was going to be. My, my immediate reaction was to become angry with her. Uh, I said, why aren't you helping these people? And she looked at me with what I think a cheap fiction writer would call a bleak expression. And she said, and this is a direct quote, she said, there is no help for them. You, you can't, can't help them. them. Jesus. Uh, okay, so eventually we got out of there and we went back to the police department and I sat down in the chair and she said, well, do you, do you still want to become trans? And I said, well, you don't become trans, you're born trans. And yes, do I have a choice? <laughs> and she said, well, yes, you can go on living as a man. And I said, but that's lying. So 
What do we do now? Grudgingly, she, but she just still did it, uh, she told me about the Stanford uh, Gender Dysphoria Program, which she could have done right at the beginning, but she put me through her little show first, and I went up to Stanford and visited with the director of that program, whose name was Donald Laub. Don is still alive. He's retired. He was running what was at that time perhaps the only program that was seriously trying to figure out more about what transgender was and provide some sort of assistance for transgender people. Because they were trying to build a record of success, they were choosing people who were very, very presentable in society at that time as the gender of their choice. So if you happen to be a male to female uh, transgender person or transsexual, as they were called at that time, then you were expected to be the Christine Jorgensen model. You're tall, thin, willowy, blonde, liked heels, wore lots of makeup, dresses, wanted nothing more in life than to marry a man, settle down and figure out some scientific way to make babies. Hot damn, I am absolutely none of those things. What an adventure this is going to be. And I walk in to Don's office and, and I say, I am interested in the gender reassignment. And Don looked me up and down and said, quote, to what? I should explain that I was uh, doing my best macho man presentation at the time. I was working in the, in the recording industry when I did this, and the recording industry at the time was extremely sexist. I had a beard, I was wearing jeans and engineer boots, and I had worked very, very hard on having a deep, impressive voice. I took up a lot of social space. I did the whole masculine presentation as well as I possibly could. Uh And it's not the way you're supposed to go in there. Don asked me a couple of questions, including, why do you think you want to do that? And I said, well, I may not look like a woman, but in fact, I am a woman. And that became a topic of discussion for the next few years. Years? The next thing Don said, years. Wow. Don said, okay, I want you to go away, and when you come back, I want you to be presenting as what I think a woman is, and what you better think a woman is. You get a job as a woman, you get friends as a woman, you do everything as a woman, and then you come back and we'll talk. I was swimming in water that was uh, all about stereotypical behavior. Yeah. How far did I have to go there? This is a very interesting proposition because, as I'm sure you know, not all women wear dresses or heels or makeup or are tall or willowy or blonde or, for that matter, any other shape, whatever it is. That makes us women, in square quotes, doesn't have anything to do with that. But Wait, so are you telling me that you didn't, you, you, your reaction to that was that you didn't feel like you wanted to, you know, to metaphorically clothe yourself in the stereotype? Cue the cinematic music now. <laughs> <laughs> what is a woman? Is a woman? I, I mean, we could go there for hours. Yeah, right. Uh, and you, you know, I know, and I'm sure the listeners know. And this was all being thrashed out everywhere at that time, right. very much in the same way it's being thrashed out now. If you wanted to find assistance from trustworthy people in the medical field, the legal field, the psychological field, um, any of those, you had to stereotype. Mm -hmm. because otherwise they thought you were crazy. You know, as a young trans person trying to get along in that situation, get along in the world, and still make my way through to just being able to get done with that, find my place in the world, 
find my identity, and be able to get on with my life, how can I negotiate this? That's not to say that Don or anyone at the program were being chauvinistic, because they were not. What they were saying was, look, kid, if you want to get along in the world, you're going to have to look like what most people think a woman looks like, or you're going to have trouble. Did you understand that at the time, or did you... I mean, I did and I didn't. It was all new for me. It was equally new for them. We were all trying to figure out what the hell this thing called gender is. And I think one of the things that we've discovered, I mean, that was the 60s. We're now in 2018. We've had a lot of time to think about these things, study them scientifically, psychologically, every other way, standing on our heads, walking with our shins. I think I can say, as one of the people who's sometimes thought of as an authority in the field, Mm -hmm. I think I can say without fear of contradiction that we don't have the faintest idea what the hell we're talking about. Gender exists, it's there, it's in society because members of the human race construct desire through difference. It's not likely that gender is going to go away. And if the gender abolitionists ever win, my bet is that the species will immediately reinvent it. Hi-Fi Nation will return after these messages. Shortly after Sandy transitioned, she got a job as a recording engineer with the Olivia Collective. Olivia Records was a lesbian feminist record label inspired by radical feminist separatism. The idea that there can and should be women's only music, businesses, communities, all completely self-sufficient and separate from men and male-dominated industries and communities. Because Sandy was a successful recording engineer who previously recorded Jimi Hendrix, Crosby and Nash, and Van Morrison, she was more than qualified. This is where the second character enters the story, a few years into Sandy's work in the collective. Sandy, there's a strand of uh, feminist thinking that originated around the time that you were young and active, and you know before you published on these questions in you know the philosophical humanities literature. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about where that came from because you were there when this kind of thing arose. Could you talk uh-huh. could you could you tell me who was Janice Raymond and how did you encounter her work? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> when you said who was Janice Raymond, I couldn't help but but hearing the bram sound from from uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. <laughs> oh, right. Who is, who is Janice who is Raymond? Janice yeah. Raymond? Yeah. All right. Ja- Janice Raymond took me as her personal nemesis. Right, and, right. And, and I, I returned the favor for a few years, uh, but it was a silly thing for me to do. Janice Raymond published a book called The Transsexual Empire, which was a lovely choice of words, in which she called me out by name for being a recording engineer with Olivia Records that made what what we called women's music, which was political music designed to help specifically women to be more politically aware I was a trans. I never made any secret of the fact that I was trans to the collective. As far as I know, everyone in the collective knew. Janice Raymond treated her book as a way of outing me. She acted as though no one knew, and this was going to be a surprise. And once Olivia found out, I think she felt that 
they would immediately drum me out of the core, throw me out on the street, and uh, send me packing. Before the book came out, uh, Raymond sent a galley proof of the chapter called Sappho by Surgery to the collective as a means of outing me bef- before uh, the book came out. And she sent it in the guise of something she wanted to comment on. And then after it went all the way around, as we did with everything that we received, we'd send it back to the person who sent it in with our comments and suggestions. So this thing came around. It said something like, Sandy Stone at Olivia Records is a uh, uh, an egregious presence there, a typical example of men trying to force themselves on women and um, disrupt their associations and divide women, as men inevitably do. The various women of the collective read this, and at, at the copy that they were reading did not mention me by name. It used some euphemism for me. So it wasn't immediately apparent that it was about me specifically. That didn't become clear until the book itself came out, but but there's no question later that she was saying, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, there's a trans there, and her name is Sandy Stone, and you get rid of her right now. The other people in the collective were being far more angry about this thing than I was. Uh, Their general feeling was that this was some very angry person out there who had gotten some kind of burr under her saddle about trans people and was uh, writing a very nasty, uh, narrow-minded screed for some mean-spirited purpose. We We didn't quite know what it was. When it came around to me, I read it, and I said, well, this is pretty ugly, but someone eventually is going to have to write a book about uh, transgender. But I don't think this particular thing is the book. And, <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> and we, we sent that back to her. And then a few months went by, and the book came out. And the collective saw to its consternation that that chapter was about me. And in the released version, I was mentioned by name, which academically is a dodgy kind of sleazy thing to do. And immediately thereafter, we began having trouble. And now we began getting a new kind of letter. They'd say something like, we hear that you may have a transsexual person working there, and I want you to know that I think that that's a very bad idea, and uh, they're not doing a good job for you, and you should get rid of them right away. And we began getting two of these, and then three of these, and then 10 and 20 of them, and then a 100 of them at a time, and then we began getting letters that were much uglier than that, and they were about me, and um, they were violent. From there, things continued to go directly in a southerly direction. We did a tour of the West Coast of women's music. It was the first women's music tour ever in which everyone involved was a woman, unless you wanted to question my right to that sobriquet. Before we got to Seattle, when we were on our way to Seattle, we had rumors that there was a a paramilitary group called the Gorgons, a group of uh, radical uh, lesbian separatists who shaved their heads and wore camo clothing and carried live weapons and that when we got to Seattle, they intended to kill me. Did something happen at Berkeley also? Something of a different nature happened at Berkeley. That was uh, what the collective referred to as Black Thursday. We had a meeting which was staged by a group of lesbian 
separatist transphobes, they would currently be called TERFs. The term TERF is an acronym for Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminists. For one side, the term is considered an accurate description of a view. But for the other, it's considered a slur. Feminist advocates of excluding trans women like Sandy from women-only spaces like Olivia Records say they aren't trans-exclusionary. Trans men, for instance, ought to be included in men-only spaces, and probably in women-only spaces too. It actually follows from their philosophical views about what it is to be a woman. More on that later. In any case, the term they prefer is gender-critical feminist, or even gender abolitionist, because they want to abolish gender, not grant membership to it. Anyways, back to Sandy's story. They called a meeting with the Olivia Collective for a meeting hall in Oakland to talk about the Olivia situation, quote-unquote. And we sent a delegation of about half a dozen women, including me, to that. Once they had me in the room, they performed a very interesting political maneuver for which we were totally unprepared. We've, Olivia was very innocent at that point. We, we were not really fully aware of, of the intensity of the hatred that was being directed toward me specifically. The TERFs proceeded to open with a series of remarks that were designed to push my buttons, I think is the appropriate expression. Of course, we all know that transgender doesn't really exist and trans women are really men. Of course, we all know that their purpose is to divide the women's community and uh, force their views on uh, real, natural women, and you know, so on and so on. When the person giving that opening address finished, everyone turned and looked at me expectantly. <laughs> I had not come prepared to make any remarks. I thought that we were here as a collective to speak to another group about issues on which we disagreed. The women in the collective looked at me, partly bewildered, but partly just encouraging, you know, all right, Sandy, say something. And I said the worst possible thing. <laughs> it was the first thing that occurred to me, and I'm not sure that you can broadcast it, but I'll say it anyway, and then you can cut it out. I said, but I can't talk to that because it's all bullshit. And that was the end of the meeting. It turned out that the TERFs were waiting for me to say something like that, and the room erupted into fury. People were standing on tables, screaming, I mean literally, at us, at the Olivia Collective. Now we've seen Olivia's true colors. They're clutching this asp to their breasts. There's this evil person among them, this man, and he has to go right now, and we won't continue the meeting until he leaves. So we went off to a far end of the room, and we caucused the what do we do? <laughs> we're basically kids. We're women. Most of us, we're in our 20s. We're making it up as we go along. We're, we're inventing political process here with an implacable enemy. It's not a level playing field. The other side is not there to have a debate. They're just there to make us look as bad as they possibly can. Eventually, the only thing we can come up with is I have to leave. If I do leave, maybe they can get some kind of dialogue going where we can move the needle a little bit and explain that it's not the way they say it is. It's really better than that. Sandy is not dividing us. Can we talk about this in a rational way? After I left, there was no discussion there was no change in the TERF's position. There, there was no dialogue whatsoever. The collective did not succeed in moving the needle, and they came back to L.A. shell-shocked. And I think at that point, 
we really understood for the first time what we were up against. Hello? Hi, is this Janice? Yes, hi, Barry. Hi, Janice, how are you? Good. Coming up, I call Janice Raymond. We'll return to the rest of Hi-Fi Nation after these messages. My name is Janice Raymond. I was a professor at the University of Massachusetts for 28 years in the Women's Studies Department. I'm a philosopher and mainly a medical ethicist. As Sandy Stone had mentioned, Raymond's book, The Transsexual Empire, was the founding text in gender-critical feminism that addressed the question of trans identity and trans rights. I asked Raymond where she was coming from, what she was responding to, and what her argument was. I argued that men cannot become women or women men via hormones and surgery, not because women and men are essentially masculine or feminine, but because of the history, the life experience, the privilege, in this case male, or discrimination, mostly female, attached to growing up in a male or female body. I also argued that being treated with lifelong exogenous hormones, removing a healthy penis or breast or uterus, and often embarking on secondary surgical journeys to alter voice or appearance was a in my opinion, a walking tribute to the power of cultural definitions of masculinity and femininity that really teach all of us that in a gender-defined society, it's easier to conform your body to a patriarchal society's expectations than to change your society. When I started to do this work, I had gone to Johns Hopkins, where I interviewed John Money who at that point was the major proponent of what was called the core gender identity. His main theory was that core gender identity was fixed by age two. I spent a chapter of the transsexual empire criticizing Money's theories because his work was dominant in the field. And in my reading, it had set the course of arguing for a theory of female or male brain development that was posited as intrinsic to gender identity development, that is, innate. Money's work provided also the theoretical basis for the later narrative uh, echoed by those seeking a new gender identity, that they were born essentially with female brains trapped in male bodies or vice versa. The theory of gender that Raymond put forward, particularly the account of women, is that there's no biological essence that makes for womanhood, in the brain or in the body. Rather, it was the social treatment of individuals who had female bodies that made them women. I wanted to emphasize that it is the history of being born and raised in a female body, including the history of things like menstruation, the history of pregnancy, the history of childbirth, abortion, but mostly the history of female subordination in a male-dominant society, a history that men don't have because of their sex. Raymond's view is that being a woman just is having a history of being socially subordinated because of these biological abilities. It follows from this view that trans women are going to be precluded from the category. Right, at the same time, you express explicitly, at least in the 70s you did and you, you do today on your website, that you believe trans individuals should be afforded the same civil and human rights as others. Yes. Yes, but, you know, we may have a, a difference of opinion about what those human rights are. Yeah, so what are, what are the differences then? Well, one key difference is that transgendering individuals fault feminists for not acknowledging their existence. So if your existence is dependent on the fact that you have to be recognized as a member of the opposite sex... If you're not treated that way, you're misgendering, then that, that's a key in interpretation of what a human right is. 
the the human right that's the difference that's the central dividing line is that you don't think that trans women should be treated as women but what aspect of that treatment would you want to deny i mean all of it look all of it yeah all of it because it's based on a false reality I mean, what's the false reality? I mean, people feel gender dysphoria their whole lives, and there are very young children who have experienced it, you know, at the age two or something, right? I mean, those exist, right? Well, that, of course that exists. That exists with feminists. Any woman who has experienced the agony of not fitting into a society where gender is defined by rigid roles is hardly insensitive to the suffering of trans persons. And like trans persons, many women have felt dissatisfied with their bodies. But they found themselves in a, in a psychically disjointed state uh, for not accepting their role. But much of what those who identify as trans persons are going through is all, you know, it's all, it's all familiar to us. I, I guess one of the things that I might need more convincing on is that this kind of gender dissatisfaction that you're explaining is a big part of lots of women's lives and the kind of gender dissatisfaction that trans individuals have has the same kind of explanation. Has this, as there's a univocal explanation for gender dissatisfaction tr- warranting the same kind of treatment. I, I guess that's one thing I need more convince, convincing on. I don't know what you mean by um, warranting more kinds of treatment only exists because there, there are institutions now that deal with it. Um, and initially, the dealing with it was pretty bad. It was really uh, mandating that individuals had to pass in their desired sex for a couple of years. And now, um, I don't know what you mean by treatment, because now the focus is on self-identification. Yeah, but self-identification is supposed to be a solution to that, right? The idea was it's a huge burden to place on trans individuals who don't want to pass. Uh, and then they're saying, okay, fine, then now self-identification is supposed to be a solution to that, right? Well, why would you have to self-identify as a woman? Why is self-identification a solution when you're self-identifying as, as, something, as, as something else? Would you, would you use the same argument? with uh, white people, you know, who want to pass as black. There's a big or difference. Or who want to become, you know, who, like Rachel Dolezal, Dolezal say that they are black. I mean, that's, that's not, to me, a self-explanatory argument that, that self-identification is a solution. Self-identification can also be a delusion. You don't think that the explanation for why people self-identify comes from something else, something deeper? I, I think it's heavily influenced by by cultural aspects and by political aspects of what it of of what maleness and what female femaleness is in a society. Yeah, yeah, so I guess the question is how are we supposed to I, I'm just trying to get clear. I have a hard time seeing how to treat trans people with respect and equal rights while denying them treatment as the gender they're seeking us to recognize. How do you propose we do that? Not by changing the individual body but by changing society. That's something that, that feminists faced in the 1970s. And, you know, you can say, well, that's a lot to ask for, but it's no more than, than what we had to go through. Let me give you an example from the book. So there's a chapter about um, trans women who are identifying as lesbian feminists, right? Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I would have thought that an individual, as, as you would put it, you know, male-bodied individual who transitioned, but then, you know, strongly identified with lesbian feminists in, in lesbian feminist spaces, you know, Olivia Records, these kinds of places, would have been something that was, that allied itself with the right cause, that was changing society, right? But, but, you, but you criticize that. But you don't. You don't ally yourself with the, with the cause by becoming somebody you're not. I finally asked Janice about the outing of Sandy Stone in the lesbian feminist community. 
leading to the events where Sandy had to leave the collective out of fear of violence and retribution. Janice denies having played a role in it. Uh, I did not out Stone. She did name Sandy in the book, in the chapter Sappho by Surgery. But Janice claims she was reporting on an existing conflict, not causing one. The party that outed Stone was a West Coast feminist newspaper called Sister. This happened in 1977, two years before my book was published. Janice sent me a copy of an open letter that appeared in Sister, July of 1977. A group of signatories in the women's music community signed on to complain about Sandy to Olivia Records and demanded a statement as to why someone with male privilege was given a job at an organization by and for women. This is what Janice says she was alluding to in that chapter when she wrote that Sandy was dividing women. There's a copy of the letter on the website, hifination.org. I called up Sandy and one of the signatories to the letter that Janice sent me the musician Alex Dobkin, just to do some fact-checking and see if I could pinpoint exactly what happened. Neither actually remembered the letter and sister, but both confirmed that by July 1977, when the letter appeared, Sandy had long been outed. The controversy in the feminist music community over Sandy began much earlier, probably around 75 or 76. So the letter didn't out Sandy either. The signatory I spoke to Alex Dobkin also said she didn't hear about Sandy from Janice. Rather, it was through the social network of lesbian feminist musicians. And Sandy confirms that that's likely how most women in that community would have heard about it. Then there's the issue of whether Janice or her publisher sent a chapter from the book to Olivia Records. Neither I nor the publisher sent galleys of any chapter of this transsexual empire to Olivia or to Stone asking for comments. Stone claims that the completed response sheet was then sent back to the alleged sender, me. That's another fabrication. I never received these yellow, cheated responses because I never sent any document to Stone or to Olivia. The conflicting view of events here is harder to adjudicate, but here's what I found out. There was no way that Janice's book could have been the source of Sandy's outing in the community because it was published early in the year 1979 and Sandy was gone from Olivia Records by then. The book grew out of Janice's dissertation, which she completed and submitted in 1977, which means she would have worked on it in the years prior. But Janice says that the chapter in question, Sappho by Surgery, wasn't part of the dissertation. I spoke to the woman who distributed the mail at Olivia Records when Sandy was there And she has no memory of having received and distributed a copy of Sappho by Surgery. But curiously, she does have a memory of reading Janice's book, or at least its contents, well before 1979, just like Sandy did. And finally, I emailed one of the founders of Olivia Records to see if she remembers the sequence of events, but I haven't heard back. What happened next after the transsexual empire was published, and after Sandy was forced to leave Olivia, is not in dispute. Janice Raymond's The Transsexual Empire was the founding text in the gender-critical, gender-abolitionist philosophy whose ideas survive to this day in the part of the feminist movement seeking to slow the advancement of trans rights. Meanwhile, Sandy was standing in a pizza line in Santa Cruz and fortuitously met Donna Haraway, a professor in the History of Consciousness and Feminist Studies program at UC Santa Cruz. Within a couple of years, Sandy was in Donna's PhD program. One of the first things that you do is after you've taken your basic courses, uh, your advisor asks you, well, what would you like to do for your first project? I looked at Donna, and Donna looked at me, and I said, I think... I need to answer Janice Raymond. Donna said, yes. We agreed immediately that if I did that, it would very possibly end my academic career. I didn't see that I could do anything else. I I didn't know that I had a choice. It was another version of sitting with Don Laub and having Don Laub say, 
You want to transition to what? Sandy eventually wrote The Empire Strikes Back, a post-transsexual manifesto. It became a founding text of transgender studies and the first of many ongoing trans responses to gender-critical feminism. The paper that I wrote spoke from my heart, and I read it at a conference that was held at UC. It got a standing ovation, which amazed me. It was a very heavy moment for me emotionally. When I wrote that paper, I had a vision in my mind of a moment, maybe 20 or 30 years from then, when I'd go to some academic conference, I'd say, well, this topic requires some trans feedback. Would any trans people in the room kind of come over here and, and let's have a little caucus and talk about it? I didn't realize that a few years from then I would be invited to a conference to speak to 500 trans academics. That all came about in such a short period of time. I hoped for it. I dreamed of it. But hoping and dreaming are not ways that you make something happen. And so it happened. And it may have happened because I wrote The Empire Strikes Back. Now, we have an academic field called Transgender Studies, and we have academic transgender people at conferences having caucuses, and we have conferences at which most of the attendees are transgender. And <laughs> that's fantastic. Coming up next time on Hi-Fi Nation. I'm definitely against self-ID. Okay, now why is that? Yeah, I suppose I think it, it can be flippant. We fast forward to the controversy today about gender recognition certificates and the intellectual descendants of the conflicts from the 70s make their case. And now consider the person who spent 40 years living as a man, gaining all the sort of social advantage of living as a man in a society like ours. One of the main problems with this trans-exclusionary approach is thinking that the subordination and discrimination that someone faces when they're perceived as a reproductive being is the only candidate for talking about what discrimination against women is. Stay tuned after the credits for a sneak preview of our Slate Plus content. Hi-Fi Nation is written, produced, and edited by Barry Lamb. Associate Professor of Philosophy at Vassar College. For Slate Podcasts, Editorial Director is Gabriel Roth. Senior Managing Producer is June Thomas. Senior Producer is TJ Raphael. Thanks this week to Evan Urquhart and Alex Barish for editorial advice. Production assistance this season provided by Jake Johnson and Noah mendoza Goot. Visit HiFiNation.org for complete show notes, soundtrack, and reading list for every episode. That's H-I-P-H-I Nation.org. There's one more thing I do want to ask you about, though. I mean, like that chapter, though, Constructing the Lesbian Feminist did charge uh, transsexuals with a kind of rape. Yes. And that's because they only quote the first part of the sentence. Listen to how Janice Raymond responds to my question about one of the most controversial passages in the transsexual empire in the Slate Plus version of this show. You can join Slate Plus by going to slate.com slash hi-fi plus to get an ad-free feed and bonus content for this and any other Slate podcast.